When I was 16, I had a dream. And really short shorts. <laughs> I wanted to be a professional tennis player. It was all that I could think about. And I did everything that I could to become a professional tennis player. I practiced five hours a day. I played 16 tournaments a summer all across America just to become a professional tennis player. But no matter what I did, I wasn't good enough. And I failed. And what really bothers me about that failure is that I know my coach knew. He knew I wasn't good enough. He had no doubt and he didn't tell me. And I thought that was rude. <laughs> Instead, he would always ask me three questions. Did you work hard today? Did you learn something today? Did you have fun today? Always the same three questions, whether I won, whether I lost, it didn't matter. I got the same three questions. And this amazing thing happened. That even when I failed, I was never a failure. Now I'm the coach. I'm the U.S. Paralympic coach for wheelchair tennis. That's my full-time gig. I spend each day trying to emulate what my coach taught me about creating the right kind of failing. And the amazing thing is in this community, it's harder than you think. Because people always try to protect you from failing, and if you have a physical disability, everybody wants to protect you from failing. My goal is to make sure that you fail. Really. It doesn't always happen, though, and it breaks my heart. <laughs> in 2006, I was invited to go to Tanzania. I got to bring wheelchair tennis to a developing nation, and I had never done that before. It was a huge honor. And I went out to Moshi, Tanzania, and I've got Mount Kilimanjaro in the background, and I am feeling really cool. I've got 30 people ready to play wheelchair tennis. They are smiling. They are excited, except for this one. She looked at me like she hated me. For two and a half hours, she would not smile, and I did everything. I wiggled my ears, I danced, I did whatever I could, and I was going to make her smile. At three hours, I saw a little tick. And all of a sudden, she took a tennis ball, threw it at me, I let it hit my chest, and she cracked up. <laughs> For the rest of the day, she smiled, she laughed, and she was absolutely horrible. She was not a good tennis player, and to me, it was the most beautiful thing. It was beautiful failure. And as we were closing and I was walking back to the car, all of a sudden, an African woman is running at me crying. Now, for the guys out there, anytime someone runs at you crying, this is not a good feeling. <laughs> she runs up, speaking Swahili to my interpreter, and his eyes get big. And he looks at me and he says, Mr. Dan, her mother says that she has not smiled in five years. She's barely left the house. What do you say to that? The woman hadn't smiled for five years. And in that moment, I feel like I really did something great. But I didn't. The people that were around her, her parents, her teachers, whoever it was, they failed. Failure is an inevitable. Not even trying is tragic. What happens, though, when that environment is ripe for failure? And later on, about 2010, I went to France for a huge tournament called Les Petitas. The beautiful thing about that tournament is that they integrate wheelchair tennis players with able-bodied tennis players, kids playing side by side. One of my players that was supposed to go to that event got sick, and so we had to wait for medical clearance. She goes, she plays amazing tennis and loses four consecutive matches. If that doesn't define failing, I don't know what does. Four consecutive matches on the last day she loses 7-5 in the third in a marathon match. And I go and I congratulate her on her success, even though she lost. And she goes straight to her father and starts sobbing. There's a part of me that actually really likes this because she cares so much. But she lost four straight matches. And I walked away and let father and daughter have their moment. Ten minutes later, her father walks up to me with tears in his eyes. And he says, I am so damn proud of her. 
Evidently, six weeks before that, she had had sun sh shunt surgery in her brain. And just six weeks later, she was playing tennis. She was absolutely triumphant in her failure. This is my classroom now. In my classroom, we start every day with three promises because we don't need the questions. We celebrate success and we celebrate failure even more. So this weekend at the Learning Two conference, I wish for you hard work, I wish for you to learn something, and I wish you have a ridiculous amount of fun. But most of all, I wish you happy, beautiful failing.